Culture and Imperialism is the name of a text, among other things, published in the year 1993 by Edward Said. But in fact, this has been the theme of a whole lot of his works, starting from Orientalism. And there is another text in between, a text published in the year 1983, which is called The World, the Text and the Critic. Now, in that text, in the first chapter, I think called Secular Criticism, that is the introductory chapter, he tells us a very interesting story about his college day friend who is working with or who was working with the American Defense System, Defense Ministry. At that point of time, when America had attacked Vietnam, actually, to, to you know, destroy communism actually, whereas America was passing it on as protection of right to freedom of speech and expression, whatever. And then the friend had said that, had told Said that, you know, our defense secretary is not an ordinary person, he is a cultured person and then you, you know, you do not think that he is just a cold-blooded murderer like any defense secretary should be. He reads, for example, uh, Alexandria Quartet of Darrell. So, an important book. So, Said quotes that anecdote and shows that how there is an impression in our mind generated due to misconception, due to wrong training, due to ideology that a person who read, read or reads cultural texts say Shakespeare, Yeats, you know Dante or Tagore cannot be as violent as other people would be. So, but then, but then he says, is that really the case? Does culture stop imperialism or violence in any way? At least the existing cultures as they are or they rather intensify it. That is the line of enquiry that he takes up in culture and imperialism. In certain ways, of course, it is a sequel to orientalism. I have discussed and many others also have discussed and by now it is well known that orientalism basically is Said's indictment of the study of Orient by the Occidental scholars or the Western scholars in so far as those scholars did two things. One is that they did not represent the actual Orient, they had some typical features of the Oriental in their mind that Orientals are either highly spiritual, that of the old, good old Orient or they are kind of inferior, racially inferior, unscientific and all these things, the current Orient. So, accordingly they represented and then that side is true or side is right we, to understand that we need not go back to the texts of Orientalism, even if you watch movies like Holy Smoke or even Slumdog Millionaire, you will find that that kind of representation are given there. That is an India which is full of poverty, which is full of you know people uh, who are rather who rather like to be in crowded places, etc., etc. The Holy Smoke movie, for example, they will show beggars. You know, whenever an India, uh, I mean an American or even an Indian makes a movie on India, they prefer to show the poverty. And the fact is that there are other things. We have skyscrapers also, for instance, poverty is not the only case. This allegation was raised against Shottujit Ras Pothir Pachali also by Nargis, though she had not read Orientalism because Orientalism was published much later. And then Said says or shows that the same thing obtains in case of the people of the Middle East. Arab people or Islamic people also. And not only he says that other honest people or neutral people, they have corroborated it. Terry Eagleton, a great Marxist critic from Britain for example, tells us that once Said was about to visit them or I do not exactly remember, he was about to visit Said and he had told his young son that Said uncle would be coming or will be meeting him and the son was uh, rather frustrated when he did not see that Said was carrying, there was no camel with Said. Because he was an Arabian or Arab, so 
the son's idea was that Said must come riding a camel, not by car. So, that kind of stereotypes, that kind of you know set patterns orientals have been framed into by the knowledge of orientalism. So, actually it is the politics of orientalism. So, just as in orientalism he showed the relationship between knowledge and power in culture and imperialism he will show the relationship between culture and power. Both are in a way developments from Foucault and Marx, Marx first then Foucault. Now, and the prime target in culture and imperialism, the book is the novel form. Just as in orientalism, the prime targets were, there is no prime target as such, but mostly you know certain orientalists like Ernest Renan, who misrepresented Islam or even Dante, Dante is mentioned there all these things, but here particularly in culture and imperialism, the novel form. These books are complementary. Many things which are left out in Orientalism has been said in culture and imperialism. And in certain ways, Said has tried to take cognizance of some of the allegations raised against Orientalism. One being that it does not talk about the resistance on the part of the Orientals or the colonized, it only talks about one side. Now, my view is that every book cannot do everything, that we, every book will be an encyclopedia. If you do this, then why you are not doing that and if you are doing that, why are you not doing that, yet another thing that way. But still, Said felt that resistance was an important part. So, he included resistance and opposition in culture and imperialism, where he at length spoke about Fano, for example, Franz Fano. Also, took cognizance of Mugi Wathiongo, Chinu Achibi, even he has spoken about Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, you know, in the context of limitations of nationalism. Though nationalism is a good force, as long as it is against colonialism, but once colonization is over, then nationalism may become an oppressive force for, you know, the non-elites of that nation, that, that is the theory. Now, Said finds it interesting that the novel form in Europe rose to prominence coterminously with colonialism. I have told in my other videos that there are many origins of the novel or many theories regarding the origins of the novel. It has multiple origins, not one, but Said is stressing on the imperialism part. The first novel of any significance in English, for instance, Said says, is Robinson Crusoe. And if you look at it that way, what is it all about? It is perhaps nothing other than colonization. You know, a European man, a British man setting up a colony, however small, you know, however minimalist, in an uninhabited island almost, and where he educates a person called Friday, who is basically his slave, but though at one point a friendly relation grows between them. And so, just remember or call to mind Prospero and Caliban. Though Friday is not like Caliban, but then nonetheless master slave dialectic is there. So, so the very first novel, it in a way what is I trying to show is that these novels are legitimizing imperialism or legitimizing that means they were writing with full knowledge of the imperial process going on in Africa, in India for example, but they did not question that. Rather, they projected it just as you know the propaganda literature of any ruling party highlights the good active, what they think to be the good activities of the parties in whichever part of the world. So, the novelists whom we think to be generally humanists, intellectuals, they were rather the opposite according to Said. They willingly or sometimes even knowingly legitimize the imperial process and very few of them stood against them and one such figure is Conrad. But again, Conrad's affiliation was also divided. That is why Said partly happy, partly unhappy with Conrad and Conrad is a lifelong obsession with him. His doctoral dissertation was on Joseph Conrad. Later it was published as a book. In 1967, Joseph Conrad in the fiction of autobiography by Harvard University Press. Recently, I think in 2017, it has been republished by Columbia University Press, where 
in that book he exactly did not deal with the imperialist part of Conrad that came later. But anyway my thesis is that that part is there also, but anyway we are coming to some other thing. So, Robinson Crusoe for example, in the same way he talks about Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. In that novel we see lot of activities, affairs, amelioration of for example, the, the heroine in her uncle's house etcetera etcetera, it is a huge mansion belonging to Sir Thomas Bertram. But where does the money of Thomas Bertram come from? From the colonies, but that colony is not given any representation, colony in Antigua, it is not given any representation in the novel. So, it is just like feminists say that women are not given proper representation in novels, they are always so shown as subservient to men in patriarchal literature or for example, Dalits say how they are not represented or misrepresented in caste Hindu literature. In the very same way, Saif shows that colonies are either not given any representation at all or given some very marginal and grudging representation. And sometimes when they are represented fully as in Kim, in that book he has a full length essay on Kim also, Rudyard Kipling, he shows again how they typify the empire and takes it, uh, you know the novelists take it as legitimate position. The question never comes to Kipling's mind that why should British rule India, rather he is busy in showing the British empire in India fighting Russian conspiracy against Indian British government and how Kim plays a role in that. So, means empire should be intact. So, of course, Kipling was a visible imperialist even before Said we knew that, but then what Said uncovers are invisible imperialists, those whom we celebrated great champions of human rights including Jane Austen. There is a section Jane Austen and the empire under the chapter called narrative and social space in culture and imperialism. So, without Said we would not have known that Jane Austen is an imperialist we always thought she is busy in domestic fiction and two inches of ivory her canvas you know uh, rather very um, I mean not at all wide as she said. So, we know that a very strange case is that of Dickens. Now after Said we did excavations and now we know that Dickens was not only an imperialist he was a hardcore racist. He had said that the orientals should be wiped out as a race. He was a stakeholder in East India company also. But at the same time, he shed so much of tears about the misfortune of the chimney boys, chimney sweepers in England or you know sufferings of the poor. All his novels are basically about the mostly about the suffering class, English working class, hard times which is good, we celebrate that. But say something about our suffering also, he did not and kept making money from his share in East India Company. So, that means we can say that instead of calling Dickens a humanist, we can call him a white humanist rather or imperialist humanist or British humanist, not universal humanist. The same is applicable in case of Wordsworth. For example, though Said here exactly does not mention Wordsworth, but uh, it is my addition Wordsworth was also in full knowledge of what company was doing in India, its imperial practice and all. He celebrated this high priest of nature also became the high priest of French revolution and he celebrated the you know liberty, fraternity, justice, the ideals of French revolution, but then total silence on the imperialism in India. You know. Later excavations have been done on this and all these are sequels of orientalism basically. And there is a book by Meenakshi Mukherjee, Meenakshi Mukherjee we call it in Bangla, we do not call Meenakshi, but she used to write that way, The Perishable Empire, which is also very interesting in this regard, you may read someday. So, right from Robinson Crusoe through Jane Austen to Dickens to Kipling and even E. M. Forster have taken 5 to 6 novelists. He shows that all these novelists were thorough imperialists, some visible, some invisible. 
and he made the invisible visible. That is the meaning of political reading, that is the meaning of reading against the grain. Because hard melodies are sweet, but those unhard are sweeter, as Keats said in Ode on Aggression. So, you deconstruct. Similarly, another figure we will talk about after Said and then stop this Albert Camus. Camus is again appreciated as a universal humanist in so far as he showed the exi ex existential problem of humanity. But what Said shows that he was always silent about the French colonization of Algeria, the place that he novelistically represented or operated from. And also, he grossly misrepresented the Arab community without giving them any specific names, specific characteristics, etc. Just, you know, just Arabs, he used like that. But in case of French people, they have specific names, specific habitat and all these things. So, I am um, not going to give the details, it is not possible. The book is very interesting, culture and imperialism. So, after reading this, we will surely know that culture is highly imperialist. In fact, it is more imperialist than militaries and armies of imperialism, because it works by to use a you know populist trope by slow poisoning. But yes, as Gramsci says, there can be counter hegemony to hegemony. So, there can be counter novels, counter writings. For example, Dalits or the third gender people, they are now writing their counter narratives. So, collectively the colonies are now also writing back. Salman Rushdie, of course, Rushdie is now a naturalized British citizen. Andrew Sanders history of a short history of English literature, which I recommend, recommend to everyone. This is the best one volume history now. The Rutledge Carter one is rather easy, that is not good. But the Andrew Sanders one, a bit difficult, it ends with Rushdie. So, naturalized British citizen, but we know practically he is from the subcontinent. So, Rushdie, Amitav Ghosh, Model is the same thing, but uh, V. S. Naipaul. So, if you want to talk about prominent bit British novelists on a global scale or English novelists rather, I think 80 to 90 percent names will be non-British. So, that way we have also captured women's our better ones. So, you may also in future have captured the social space, the narrative space of the colonizers. That part also is taken into account by culture and imperialism. But unlike the activists who say that, okay, this book is misrepresenting this community or that, so burn the book, Said is not in favor of burning the book. He acknowledges that is his magnanimity that in spite of their colonial implications, colonialist implications, these are great books which offers you a wide range of human experience, which an ordinary book, you know, run of the mill novel however non-imperialist that is, do not offer you. So, does not offer you. So, he says that you read the great texts, but then read them with the awareness of colonialism. Now, that is political reading. Of course, that is not the political reading. There are many kinds of political readings as I have said. The feminist type is one, the Marxist type is one, the queer type is one. All these are political readings of texts, where each particular methodology takes up one community, one gender, one race and shows how cultural texts, novels or literary texts have marginalized them. So, sides or post-colonialist strategy is to show how colonies have been misrepresented, marginalized or distortedly represented or not represented at all in the great texts of the English tradition and the European tradition. So, I hope uh, the thing has become clearer for my students who are my immediate clientele and also, also others who, may, who are kindly listening, they may find it interesting. My lecture is not important, the books are important. So, if it you know propels you to go back to the book and study further, excavate further, just type Dickens, imperialism, racism in Google and see what comes up. Dickens's letters where is talk about, spoke about wiping out the orientals as a race. I think your vision of Dickens will change, that will be a proper revision. Thank you so much, I end here.